This is another map from the exhibition, and these are the different ethnic groups that we're dealing with. You'll see art from many of these. And what I wanted to point out here was um, that the more yellow areas there are where Batwa, what, what I call Batwa, which means the original people in the Bantu languages, or what you would probably call pygmies, live. And they're an integral part of um, this society. There's two categories in the rainforest. You've got Bantu who do agriculture, and who are considered to be the latecomers who came later on, and Batwa who are considered to be the first inhabitants of the land. Today they live in, um, on their own a lot. They're not completely isolated, they're very much integrated into local economies, but they're somewhat disdained and they're definitely a lower class. They oftentimes serve as day laborers for their neighbors who disdain them and say that they're uncivilized. And there's evidence that in the past this wasn't the case for even documentation from 80 years ago shows that there was much intermarriage going on, as, whereas today there is no very, very little intermarriage between Bantu and Batwa. And I will explain to you in a few moments some of these really fascinating myths that recount a much greater former respect for the, the Batwa, the pygmies, and the rituals that they're incorporated into that are an important part of understanding the history and cosmologies of this region. Whether they be Bantu agriculturists or Batwa hunter-gatherers, as they're called, all these groups speak Bantu languages. So we know that the Batwa, if they were there originally, we're not completely sure about that, but they did borrow languages from the Bantu who come in. And some of our evidence goes back to 1500 BC where they've already borrowed it and they've separated away. So what happens by the separating away is they speak a dialect of a Bantu that is their own. So everyone's speaking Bantu languages, even if they're Batwa pygmy hunter gatherers. The Bantu languages got their start about 4,000 years ago in northern Cameroon and the, just south of the grasslands area. And what it was is they were a group of people who began to move south into the rainforest. And by moving south, their language develops differently from the people who are left up in the grasslands. That language up there is called Bantoid and not very well studied to this day. The connections between Bantu and Bantoid are not completely laid out yet. Um, <clears throat> they began moving south into the rainforest, and this is how they end up expanding. They end up, Bantu language is the most widely spoken in Africa today, and it's always been kind of a mystery for historians what was it that allowed this to happen. Oftentimes in the old days, Europeans would say, well, they conquered because that was the model Europeans had of taking over. Other people said they came with iron. We know that's not true. But one thing about my work that I talk about is the ideologies they brought with them tended to incorporate people or at least deal somewhat respectfully with them. And so we may be looking at cosmological, religious ideologies too that help them to expand and, and meet other people and deal with them in a way that didn't, uh, it, they did incorporate other people and their culture tended to be preferred as they moved south with other indigenous peoples. We want to go back a little further in time to get back at what came before Bantu because that's an important aspect of understanding the ideologies. And this is a map of the original four language groups of Africa and what we're looking at here is the Niger-Congo on the left. And that is the great, 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 great grandmother of Bantu and Bantoid languages. And this is important to understand because as the Bantu are moving south, they're bringing ideas with them that are left as a language separates off, its descendant daughters carry cultural traits, linguistic traits, and so we can trace these back and kind of understand what the original Niger-Congo was like. So there's many traits that are carried down into the grasslands region, and then the Bantu carry these. And this is an important thing to understand why when you go to West Africa, you'll see similarities in ideologies with people here because it's this ancient Niger-Congo heritage. That's also really key to understand how Africans forced over here to the US created communities based on common ideologies, even though many were from this region, many were from this region. There are some common elements that they understand, such as the role of water in religion or the ancestors and that type of thing that come from the ancient Niger-Congo language, which we know existed about 12,000 BC at least. So we're looking here at this ancient Niger-Congo mother, grandmother language. And I need to talk to you about the things that the Bantu are bringing with them as a heritage from this ancestry as they come south. 
And these are the material objects that we find archaeologically that correlate very well with linguistic evidence for the arrival of the Bantu in the rainforest. So we see pottery and ceramics were, which were not there, which were not present in the rainforest, even though populations were there. We do have people in the rainforest. They were not using pottery. And these polished stone tools, which is a new kind of technology <clears throat> that allows for clearing of land, and they're associated with a much more advanced, not advanced, but much much more, they're associated with agriculture, pretty much. And the type of agriculture they're bringing out, because they're from these rainforest regions, is the kind where you have to take the shoot off a plant or the tuber of a yam and plant it, rather than seed agriculture, which happens in savanna areas of Africa. So they bring this knowledge of planting agriculture with them down. And like I said, we find this in archaeology all across the continent as they move south. What I want to get to more here is what we find ideologically that they're bringing back down as far as Niger-Congo thinking that they brought with them. And the first is a cosmology that's focused on three categories of spirit. The first is a supreme creator God that is so important and so kind of remote that you don't approach that God directly. That God is often conceived of as having, not as either gender, that's having both aspects of both male and female, because it's creation and you can't do creation without both male and female. So you'll see various ways that this God is talked about or represented. And the next category that's very important is ancestral spirits, the people of your own lineage. And because they die and they pass into the other world, they're closer to that creator God. And that is who you supplicate and venerate as an intercessor with that very powerful God. <clears throat> and the third category is nature spirits that are associated with sacred places on the land. And they are sometimes called ancestral, and it's been a little bit confusing for Westerners to figure out, well, what is a what's a nature spirit versus what's an ancestral spirit? And so part of my work has been trying to untangle this and give explanations for the difference between the two. So I'll explain to you why they are sometimes considered ancestral as we go through today. The second thing they brought with them is the idea of politi political reader leadership, that encompasses the religious sphere as well, someone called a kumu, that could be a male or a female. And their legitimacy is determined by how well they can mediate between people, adjudicate cases, how well they can gather people. And as you're moving into a new terrain, you need to have people with you. So a big key to success is being the type of person who's beneficent, who can treat people well, who can educate, adjudicate uh, disputes and have people be around you. Because if you're in a frontier, you're moving out, you need people or you're not going to survive. And then really key, and this is that religious aspect where we've got, they need to be able to access the other worldly powers so that you can have success in your settlement, in your life, in your family. This third one is a little bit more complicated. Well, it's not yet. It will be complicated when I get to it <laughs> as it applies to the land. But this is really key in Central African culture, and it's the principle of precedence. Utmost respect must go to those who came first. This would mean the elders, the first wife, the older siblings, and what we're going to be looking at is the first settlers, the autochthonous people, the indigenous people of a land. And this is a precept that does not disappear easily in African cultures. If any of you know African cultures, you know this is still very strong today. Um, I think that maybe I need to stay on no, no, that one. Yeah, we're going to stay on that one. I'll come back to you. Come back to that in just a minute. So those are the three key ideologies that we're talking about. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit without so many slides right now. And I wanted you to understand, of course, as I told you already, that there, the Bantu did not come into empty lands. We have evidence that there were autochthonous populations there. Who were these autochthons? What were they doing? We know from archaeology they lived in campsites, not villages. They used very small microlithic tools. Um, they did trade raw materials, 80 kilometers at least. They tended to be materials that they made their tools out of stone. And as soon as Bantu began arriving, they began incorporating some pottery and polished stone axes into their site. So we can see this slow transition through archaeology. 